head kollegid, taamid ja härad. Meie külaline on kaugelt sellepärast, et ma kasutaks ka hea meelega järgnevalt tema keelt, et ta saaks aru ja ma usun, et inglis keel ei tekita ka teile probleeme. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy that I have a great honor to introduce you one gentleman who came from the uh, United States, exactly from Canada, but is representing an organization which name is uh, Intelligent Community Forum. And uh, the gentleman's name is uh, John G. Young. He is a co-founder of this organization. I will not to tell uh, anything about this organization, I guess, uh, Mr. Young will tell you good precisely about this organization, activities, goals and outputs. But I have to mention that uh, I am quite happy that Tallinn City has been recognized this year, fifth time, as uh, one of top seven most intelligent communities of the world. And uh, I think uh, despite it, this uh, competition will go on and in June will be selected uh, Intelligent Community of Jürgen. But despite the fact, uh, I think uh, this is a great uh, honor Gert, and very high recognition for Tallinn City to be fifth time among those best top seven competitors. Gert. And as far as I know, Gert, the number was somewhere around the 400 who seek to be Gert, recognized as we were. But anyway, uh, short story, is is the best story, and now the floor is yours. John, please tell about your organization. All right, thank you. Thank you. So can everybody hear me? Everybody back there? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. Um, I, uh, I give presentations all over the world. Uh, and uh, part of the problem is people are building smart cities and uh, they all want to have smart cities in their, uh, in their communities, in their countries. Uh, but, uh, you know, we could call ourselves the Smart Cities Institute uh, or the Smart Cities Forum, but that's not telling the whole story. So what I thought I'd do today is... Um, uh, tell you a little bit of, about smart cities, a concept called smart growth, which is an urban planning concept, and uh, what the intelligent community movement is all about. Um, so, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, afterwards. Uh, but um, there's so many different ways to describe uh, what smart cities or digital cities or knowledge cities or learning cities are all about. Uh, they're called uh, intelligent communities. Uh, they're, they're called all sorts of different things. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create better cities for people. And that's really the essence of what this talk is going to be about. Um, you know, smart cities, if you're looking at what they're all about, they're about infrastructure. They're about creating better urban performance. And uh, they're taking uh, infrastructure, both hard and soft, putting metrics to them, putting meters on them, creating uh, you know, higher performance measurements about what those cities are about. And uh, some cities are better managed. Uh, some cities have uh, these metrics that people are able to make decisions around, and it, it's about cost performance. Uh, so you have urban capital that's created as a result of that. And sometimes cities compare one city to another and say, I'm a better city than you are because I have better urban capital. Uh, some of them talk about their environment, having a better environment in their community. And that creates environmental capital. Uh, but then there are many cities that work with technology organizations like IBM or Cisco or others. And what they do is they also work on advanced systems. Again, 
probably metrics around meters and so forth. And they create intellectual property, intellectual capital around what goes on to their systems. And uh, they are used by cities to make decisions about this performance. So what, th what you're doing is you're creating opportunities for improved smart grid infrastructure, or you might have very, perform uh, very high performing data systems and uh, uh, you might create social infrastructure where people are talking to each other on, on a lot of different uh, mediums. And uh, that creates social capital around which uh, cities are able to perform better than others. And so this is what I'm describing as smart cities. And in fact, um, uh, there's a different concept out there, not to be confused with smart growth. Smart growth is a North American concept mostly, but maybe it's also uh, here in uh, Europe and elsewhere, where uh, uh, theories and practice of urban planning talk about limiting uh, sprawl. And this is, in North America, that's a big deal because people with their cars keep moving outwards and keep growing these cities and wasting agricultural lands and so forth. So less of an issue here in, in Europe but definitely is a, is a, is a, a concept in uh, North America. And instead, uh, what they're trying to do is create these livable cities. And you might have heard of livable cities. Uh, Singapore definitely refers to itself as a livable city. And uh, again, one that's much more compact, uses all of the transportation mobility ish, uh, opportunities. And some of the things that you're talking about here in Tallinn certainly uh, uh, is uh, makes your city a much more livable uh, city. So smart growth deals with urban planning and land use issues and there's a whole bunch of different things that that it might cover. So what's an intelligent community? Well an intelligent community is a little bit of odd math. Uh, one plus one equals three. Uh, why is that? Well first of all and I, again a little bit of fun here uh, we had these kinds of principles that we just talked about. Essentially, urban performance, in other words, urban capital, and you add the environmental capital that we just talked about, and you have the skills capital that we talked about in terms of some of the uh, high performance measurements, and now you have what is known as smart communities or smart cities. It's really based on urban performance and competitiveness. Now you take that, basically these elements, and you say, all right, if we have that, that's really just the one component. Now you add all those other components, including innovation and advocacy and marketing and sustainability and these kinds of issues. Now you're beginning to talk about intelligent communities. So it's a much more holistic perspective. So smart cities plus all of those other things equals intelligent communities. And uh, intelligent communities don't just stop there. They talk about things like collaboration, how leadership works in a city, uh, how good governance works. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these in a minute, but that just helps to explain why it's more than just one and one. It's about a lot of other things. And when you put that synergy together, you're actually creating something more something bigger than just the addition of the, uh, the new ideas. So what we're really talking about is this concept of it takes a smart city to become an intelligent community. So you really, in North American terms, when we talk about smart cities and all the different things that go along with smart cities, that's only a base. And then you build on it, and that becomes the intelligent community. And I'm going to take a couple of uh, examples of uh, moving forward. But why are we even talking about intelligent communities? What's the point? Why, is the, why do we even bother? Well, one of the reasons we bother is because there's a global search for talent. There's a global requirement for talent. And talent comes, is generated through a lot of different ways. In a place like this institute here, this uh, facility, this college, but also on the, on the training field. 
uh, in factories, in, uh, in all sorts of different places around the world that don't look like a, an institution. Uh, and people will go to find that talent. They will go through, even the economic crisis, the best thing that they could do is find the talent and, and work with it. So um, uh, every city feels that it needs to keep its talent. And how do you keep your talent? Well, there was a study done in the United States by a group called the Knight Foundation, a book called The Soul of the City. And they said, you need three things to keep your talent. One, affordable housing. Two, efficient and affordable transit. Well, in your case, it's free. Uh, but another thing is things to do. Uh, if you don't have things to do, the people leave. Simple as that. And I know from my daughter's point of view, when I tried to get her to work in a particular city, she said, I'm not interested in that city. There's nothing to do. Uh, so that's a very important concept. Another concept is you have to love your city. And there's a reason for that. People like what they see. They like what they, what they do. And place the concept of place, urban place, matters. Uh, and that has to do with architecture, has to do with culture, has to do with a lot of different principles around place. Good libraries, good cultural facilities, those sorts of things. And innovation and creativity happens in those kinds of environments. When you have a place where lots of creativity happens and things to do happen, you do have a lot of creativity and innovation that takes place in those environments. So not just about infrastructure, not just about people, but now actually doing something around that. Creating and uh, innovating creates opportunities for jobs. It also creates opportunities for commercialization of that innovation. And so what we look for in cities are the kinds of innovative things that go on in a city so that you can create those jobs. And hopefully you keep those creative juices in that city to keep those jobs going. Now where are some of the places that this happens? Some of the best places in the world are even here in, in, uh, in Europe. Switzerland and Sweden, uh, Denmark, other places like that are considered by uh, uh, this uh, index as uh, uh, high uh, innovation factors and innovation leaders. You also have the creation of what is known as innovation ecosystems. And that's what we look for in these intelligent communities, is to not only create opportunities for jobs and competitiveness to, to excel, but the entire ecosystem. So it's much more than what we just talk about in terms of a smart city. We talk about all those other ingredients. And what are some of those ingredients in the creative cities? Well, first of all, a lot of these creative cities are now being used for marketing purposes uh, to convey very powerful optics for city attraction, for attracting investment foreign direct investment particularly. Some cities are using this whole idea of creative industries to in fact uh, reposition their city and help it to survive. They're trying to change the way people perceive their city as being negative to being considered as positive through this idea of creativity and innovation. So the creativity city, creative cities movement is one that uh, uh, is taking place all around, uh, around the world. And why is this happening? It's, again, to create jobs and prosperity in your city. But what it's also doing, at the same time, it's beginning to create the loss of jobs. Because once you start to create these new ideas and these new job opportunities, you're also taking away sometimes these old industries. Uh, and sometimes those people who are involved with the old industries no longer have their jobs. And so there's a conflict that occurs in some cities and what happens is those jobs no longer exist 
and people are out of work and they complain. So what happens in some of these cities is they're looking to understand the future better. It's very complicated indeed. How do you make money on some of these social, um, uh, you know, social enterprises? People don't know how to make money on, on some of these things. So while it's being very complicated, uh, we have these intelligent communities that try to figure out and balance uh, what's going on in their cities. Why? Again, because people can leave. They have feet. They can go to anywhere they want. They can get, on, get in a car and move to another city that they might perceive as being better. And so if you want to keep those people in your community, you have to try and find that balance of how you, how, how you can uh, advocate for new jobs, but also how you deal with people who've just lost their jobs, and you may have to retrain them to, uh, to have newer job positions. So that's one of the things that intelligent communities do. They look to balance these things. Why are these things happening? Partly because of globalization. Uh, we've done it to ourselves. We put fiber optics under the water and the seas, connected it to other places, India, uh, the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, uh, Africa. And what's happening is you have disparity between what you, what you spend in your jobs and what other people are spending in those other locations. So there's high competition, great labor arbitrage between cities like Tallinn where you know uh, it's very expensive maybe in comparison for somebody's job versus somebody in Africa who can maybe do the same job but is going to charge a lot less or in parts of China or places like that. So this is what's happening in, in, in global societies and what we're trying to do in the Intelligent Community Forum is to not only understand it, to do the research around it but help to educate cities around the world that they can do better. And what we do is we use examples. So Tallinn is one of those examples that we constantly use to say, look at what you do in your city here, and we show that to the rest of the world. So you become a model, an example. Now I'm not going to show about Tallinn because you know about Tallinn. I'm going to show you examples from other parts of the world. And, uh, we have a number of uh, concepts and ideas that, that are going to be described by these, uh, these communities. Now, when we evaluate these cities, we look at some of these principles. I already told you about some of these things, about the infrastructure and built form, about education, creativity, marketing, digital inclusion. These kinds of criteria help us to rate these cities. And Tallinn always comes up as very high as part of the evaluation. Uh, some cities, and I'm just going to give you some strategies of intelligent communities, some cities deal with issues of mobility. You know, lots of congestion that might happen in their cities, so they figure out ways to create better senses of mobility, like, you know, better transportation or better use of transportation. Some of it is about creating better systems for transportation so that the transportation moves a lot faster through red lights and through intersections and so forth. So the use of technology to help in those cases. Other cities, they figure out mobility issues that are everybody's issues, uh, but sometimes they go the extra mile. For instance, in Eindhoven, Holland, this bus system is a driverless bus system. And why? Because it has higher tolerances for movement through very tight areas. A bus driver can't drive through those tight areas. It has to have technology to do that. Other systems are uh, used in Brazil to move people through and onto the buses faster so that there's greater efficiencies and of course uh, high transit uh, capabilities in other cities. Uh, but then we also talk about mobility using water or you know air and, and other kinds of uh, ways to move people through. Also about pedestrian and, and cycle uh, ways to move people through, even to the point of moving waste by vacuum systems, uh, like in uh, Denmark and, and in Sweden, as an example. 
or in terms of distribution systems for food and other things like that. So we look at how we can create more model cities. Some of them are even distributing from urban centers where food is produced uh, within the urban environment as opposed to having to bring it in from, from the outside. Or looking at it from the point of view of the individual and how that individual moves around. Uh, many people, like in the United States, most of the people, 57% now, are considered mobile workers. Uh, they have all these jobs. <coughs> Excuse me. They have all these jobs now that are really in terms of mobility, not in terms of sitting at, at a desk anymore. Uh, and then it's a question of, well, how do you educate these people around the world? Uh, one of the ways to do it, this gentleman here, the Sikh, has figured out how to create a very inexpensive tablet. For $35, he creates a tablet that uh, has been very similar to iPad that was hundreds of dollars, but he's given it to 250 million children in India and in China and other places like that. It's called the Ashkot tablet. And this is another way of creating uh, a better lifestyle, a better way of, of working by making sure that everybody gets an opportunity to be educated. Or this gentleman here called Clever U, a university, not in an institution, in a building, but a university on a smartphone. Or taking education to the field, out to the farmers, out to the jungles, and uh, seeking the mobility worker in, in, in those locations. But it has to have a good backbone. It has to have a good backup system in order to make all these things work. So it's not such a simple thing as just saying we're going to have uh, mobility in the jungle. It still has to have a backup and a backbone to be able to do that. And then we figure out ways in which we can create transactionable methodologies around the technologies where we can actually make money out of all these different things. And that's what is going to inspire people and incentivize them to, uh, to do all these things and to invent these applications and uh, to make these things work all around the world. So we're, uh, we've talked about lots of different ideas. Now what uh, is happening with uh, these concepts? Uh, I mentioned already all these different concepts that are part of the intelligent community. And let's just move to some strategies of these 12 here that I'm going to talk about. Uh, some of these cities are very similar in, in what Tallinn does. I'll usually have a, a section here with Tallinn to explain to people in other parts of the world what you're doing. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to take these 12 concepts and apply them to, uh, to each of these uh, cities. Uh, some of these I've already talked about, infrastructure, education, innovation, and so forth. But there are many others here that that we didn't talk about yet, such as uh, risk capital, uh, architecture, and urban design. They're all part of uh, intelligent communities. And I think that there are 12 steps to creating a very good idea around intelligent community futures. So for instance, in the first one, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Maybe you don't know where that is. Uh, but that is in the middle of the United States. And Chattanooga is a, a small city, uh, about the same size as, uh, as Tallinn. It's about uh, just under 400,000 people. It had very dirty air. Uh, it was so dirty you couldn't see people in front of you when you were driving your car. People had to walk and make sure the cars didn't bump into each other. It was that dirty at one time. They got together and they had to clean the air. And they figured out how to do that. And then they said, well, if we're able to fix the air here, maybe we can fix our downtown. Maybe we can fix our waterfront. And that's what they did. They were able to pull the community together, collaborate, and figure out things that they didn't f know that they could do before. They instilled confidence in themselves to do these things. So uh, they created a very wonderful downtown, as you can see, a very wonderful waterfront with an aquarium, lots of tourism now. But then they said, what are our assets in the community that we can benefit from? One of those assets was their electrical system. They owned their own electrical system, so they said, 
why don't we take the electrical system and create fiber optic opportunities for our, uh, for our uh, citizens. Uh, we want to make sure that we keep the people here in town, the talent that's here. And so they created a gigabyte environment for their broadband. In the United States, that was the first time that has ever happened. This means that companies, uh, individuals who are animators or work in high-speed uh, uh, broadband with great uh, digital requirements, they were able to stay in this community coming out of their colleges instead of having to go to other big cities. So this was one of the first small cities that was able to continue to attract and retain that talent. Uh, and as a result of that, they uh, created a very smart grid and uh, continued to attract a lot of businesses to the area. Uh, Amazon.com is there. Volkswagen from Germany located there. Um, many health centers, art centers, uh, research centers. So all of a sudden this little community that had dirty air one day turned around and now has become a real good research center and a really good place to, uh, do, to do business. Uh, but it started with good infrastructure, good high-speed broadband. Place in Waterloo, Canada. Again, not much bigger than uh, this region, uh, about uh, 550,000 people. But uh, what, they're, what they excel at is really good education. A couple of universities, a couple of good colleges. But the one thing that's different from this university town than others is the universities don't keep the intellectual property. They created a, pro a policy that said, you invented it, it belongs to you. So what it did was attracts uh, university professors and students who realize that by going to this university and using the technology and tools and the workmanship of, of uh, professors and students, that whatever they create, they own, has created a, an environment where a lot of new businesses have started up. Um, it's the home of the Blackberry. comes out of that university environment. It's the home of uh, Open Text and uh, Christie Digital, many international organizations that were created because of a public policy of the university to say that uh, what, what you create is your own. It also has resulted in 150 research centers. This is for a town of uh, half a million people. 150 research centers. One of those research centers is now the home of Stephen Hawking and uh, the Perimeter Institute. Um, and they look at uh, string theory and black holes. <laughs> One of the things that happens as a result of that, it brings a lot of international attention to this little town where nobody ever heard of it before. But now it gets a lot of publicity as a result of these kinds of international leaders coming in and using these, uh, these community opportunities. Uh, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is a city that is surrounded by conservatism. Uh, Texas is a very conservative place. Uh, but Austin is very liberal. Austin is a place that calls itself weird and likes to call itself weird. Um, it has 225,000 students. That's one of the reasons why it's so liberal. It has music. It has film. It has a thing called South by Southwest, big festival, supported by these students for free. But it brings famous uh, musicians, famous artists, and famous inventors. Uh, Twitter comes from South by Southwest because it was an experiment that South by Southwest people used for several years and then that kind of product came as a result of it. It has the same kind of environment that you have here where people are so pleased that it created Twitter like you have Skype that there's always the idea that maybe the next Skype or the next Twitter will come out of that particular environment. Another one, Brainport, Holland, Eindhoven. Uh, this is an area that was threatened because Philips, a homegrown company, 
was leaving and going to Amsterdam. Why? Because it had a headquarters environment in Amsterdam that it didn't have in Eindhoven. They couldn't get the people to go to Eindhoven. It was, you know, in the middle of Holland and it wasn't very attractive. Uh, so they thought that they should go to Amsterdam. What happened in Eindhoven was they were threatened. They had a crisis. Philips, a homegrown company, is now leaving. Well, we have to do something about it. So what they did was they came up with a whole new concept called open innovation. Open innovation is an idea by an American out of Oakland, California. Henri um, uh, uh, was the fellow that came up with the, uh, with the idea. But uh, it was actually implemented best in Holland here in, in, uh, in Eindhoven. And they created 55,000 new jobs as a result of that. So a crisis sometimes is really good to take advantage of, but it needs you to pull together as a community to create collaborative uh, leadership to take advantage of that crisis. So that's an example of uh, taking advantage of it. Stockholm. Stockholm takes advantage of good governance. That good governance uh, f focused on making sure that uh, there was opportunities for competition. Uh, when people get uh, have that kind of level of confidence in the government, it attracts uh, investment. And so this concept and, and Stockholm is a good, uh, a good example for that. Uh, in terms of good design, good architecture, examples are uh, like Singapore. When you have really good urban places, people remember it. They like what they see. They also want to stay in that community or they want to live in that kind of a community. So I think it's very important to have good urban planning, good architecture, good urban design as part of your intelligent community. Culture and diversity. Uh, a little place called Stratford, Ontario built on its name. And what it did was it developed a strategy to create foreign direct investment opportunities. What it did was it said, in Stratford, they created a little theater, and that theater was seasonal. Combined with the agriculture that was seasonal, they couldn't do much more than just work seasonally. But what could they do to turn it around and become a year-round opportunity? Well, they took their culture, this theater opportunity, and they added all sorts of people from all over the place to come and work there year-round. And that was organized uh, by the mayor and by their economic development department to create and broaden the economic base to create that diversity. But they leveraged the theater opportunities uh, and made it a year-round opportunity. The way they did that, very smart. They created a university environment that focused on digital media and they created a major international conference around digital media in this small community. They used a hockey arena in order to pull this uh, group together. And now it's so big, this conference is so big, they can't do it in this town anymore. They have to go to a much bigger city to be able to uh, take advantage of it. And their, their conference now is in Brazil and in many other cities around the world. But it started here, and it was because of the leadership of the mayor to pull this culture and diversity uh, together. It's very important to attract risk capital. You need to have venture capital come to your community. How do you do that? Well, uh, you have to gain confidence in bringing that venture capital into the community. Again, good governance is part of that. A city like Hong Kong is a great example of being able to attract venture capital. Now, it has great mass appeal, but one of the other things that it has, it has facilities where the venture capital can be brought together. Uh, what's important about uh, a place called Cyberport in Hong Kong is it focuses on bringing together new ideas like digital media, uh, a soft landing pad for international companies, it also uh, reduces the risk 
of bringing that risk capital in and getting it uh, through the system. Don't forget, Hong Kong also says it's the door to China. So it is embracing uh, that uh, aspect of, uh, of venture capital. Digital inclusion is one of the, I think, one of the most important uh, game changers that a city can uh, undertake. You know, once you're that much more advanced in your community to say, we want to include everyone in the community to participate in digital opportunities. That includes the disenfranchised, the young, the elderly, everybody involved. Well, then that's, that shows the maturity of a city. And uh, I think that that is a, is a game changer for a community. Here's an example, Rio de Janeiro. This is a story of a city uh, that is divided between the rich and the poor. And if you know about Rio at all, uh, along the beaches of Copacabana and, and uh, Ipanema are very expensive uh, condominiums and very expensive hotels, very rich people along the beach. But right behind it are these hills where the slums of uh, the Rio de Janeiro slums exist. It's called the favelas. And uh, they're so bad that for years uh, they've had gunfights uh, and uh, you can't go into those slums, you might not even come back out alive. That's how bad it is. But uh, over the years, they created this idea of pacification. In other words, uh, they've been toning down the, uh, the, the gunfighting. And instead, what they've done, right in the middle between the rich and the poor, they've created these six knowledge squares. And the next six knowledge squares offer uh, test beds for every kind of technology. Uh, when uh, the poor are invited in to be trained on computers, on tablets, on big iconic walls, what they're doing is they're training people, sometimes people who've never even read or, or been able to write before. And uh, these people are inspired by the technology and are able to learn very quickly on how to use the, some of this technology. Some of them are little kids from the, from the poor, um, and they bring their parents. And the parents are inspired to learn by being taught in some of these classrooms. For the first time, they feel like they're part of society. Some of these people uh, in these knowledge squares are trained to do very menial work, maybe just typing, uh, or they might uh, learn how to do some very uh, simple tasks. Why? They are going to have the World Cup. They're going to have the Olympics. They're going to have Formula One. And they need lots of people to help out on all sorts of things. Where are they going to get these people from? They can't bring them in. They need them from the local population. So on one hand, they figured it out, and they're training some of these people for those jobs. On the other hand, the people who are coming from the slums, they're being given jobs. This is the first time that they've gotten a job. In fact, people who go into that training center, 30% of them are already getting jobs. They never worked before. You know, they used to steal maybe or, or just uh, do nothing. They're now working. And they're proud of the fact that they're able to work. So this is a very, very important thing. In fact, it's a better legacy than a sports stadium. It's the, the legacy is people being able to be proud of the fact that they're now able to become part of the talent quotient for their community. A very important concept, and I'm very pleased that uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro has been able to do that. Um, another idea is uh, how do you create sustainability in your community? Everybody talks about it. Uh, Toronto is doing something about it on their waterfront. 3,000 acres, all the buildings have to be green LEED certified. That's a high level of uh, green buildings. They're creating a gigabyte environment that is attracting people to come into those uh, buildings. The sustainability factor is uh, it a, has a transit first uh, development focus. You can't build a building unless there's transit built there first. So that's very important. Uh, 
the clean uses and reuses and practices of green, green technology are, are there. And those policies and examples now spread from the waterfront to other parts of the city. Very important as part of that sustainability feature. So this is one of the kind of uh, uh, environmental but uh, high sustainability concepts that are part of intelligent communities. Health and safety, crime, all those things. Can they be helped by technology? Of course they can, particularly if you have high-speed broadband that allows for these things to happen. And in Ohio, Columbus, uh, Ohio area, there's a little town called Dublin. And Dublin, Ohio has created a thing called uh, Dublink, which it provides as high-speed broadband throughout their community and into, into uh, Columbus. And the hospitals are totally paperless. You go in there and all you see is computers, some some uh, screens, no paper. And uh, all of the health and, and medical uh, records are all done on tablets and the, the, the nurses come in and there's no paper technology or paper uh, uh, around. It's a very clean environment. It's only possible because of the high-speed broadband capabilities in the community. That same high-speed broadband provides for uh, safety issues in, in the community and you know, lots of different things that are talked about in the community from a crime and prevention point of view. And finally, marketing and advocacy. I can't stress the fact that unless you blow your own horn, as they say in the United States, nobody else is going to do it for you. Uh, you have to be uh, your biggest advocate and you have to advocate to government to create good policies and uh, good laws to support uh, what you do in your community. But then you also need to go out and you need to market and tell the world about how good your community is. Uh, nobody else is going to do that for you. So Riverside, California, it's a city outside of LA, uh, 10 years ago was just another suburb. Totally forgotten, nobody cared. But the mayor and the university president got together and created a new plan that included refurbishment, renovations, lots of infrastructure, but then created all of these different policies and practices that we just talked about uh, to create a better and intelligent community. But mostly important out of all of this was at the end when they created this wonderful city, they now went out and told the world about it. And they marketed it through different processes. In fact, uh, one of the processes was to come to the Intelligent Community Forum and take advantage of earned media. What we did was uh, put them through this test just the same way as Talene puts it through the test. And then when they got to be one of the top seven, and then eventually uh, won Intelligent Community of the Year, they went out and told everybody. They went through the newspapers, to magazines, uh, on television, created videos, uh, did all these different things to let people know about it, and they started to get business coming into their community as a result. And so it created that sustainable idea that we talked about uh, earlier. So those are the things that, uh, that happen in the cities around the world, and I've just given you 12 quick examples. There are 120 cities that we work with, and we've been doing it since 1999, and the way we do it is every year we ask cities to let us know if they think that they could qualify as intelligent communities. And uh, every year, out of hundreds of applications, we pick 21 smart cities. And of those 21 smart cities, and this is the group that we picked last year, we then in uh, January of every year pick seven. And uh, this year, Talene uh, was one of the seven that came through the process. And what we do is we work with the cities. We come and we visit, like I'm doing today. Uh, we write reports. Uh, we analyze. We send the material to over 100 people around the world who are judges. Um, they're on every continent of the globe. And they evaluate. Uh, we also use a a consulting firm uh, that helps to quantify and qualify some of the data. And uh, we have uh, university analysts 
that help us to uh, identify these cities. And as a result of all of that, in June of every year, we celebrate not only the seven cities, but we also then pick one of them because the seven cities all want to know who's the best. And uh, it's always fun to see this, but it's also very terrible when you're not one of the, the, the finalists. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, we've seen uh, many cities around the world uh, since 1999 taking advantage of that. And then of course they promote themselves again. It's part of the marketing for the next year. What we do is, uh, as an organization, Intelligent Community Forum, uh, we do research, we work with the cities, we write books, we've now developed institutes. Uh, we've started some in the United States, but we're also working with some to develop them here in Europe and in Asia. And uh, uh, we give lectures and we, we do other kinds of uh, programs like that, conferences and so forth. But more importantly, the cities themselves have said, that's nice, but we want to create an association. And so they did. And Tallinn was one of the founding members of the association uh, called the Intelligent Community Forum Foundation. And one of the things that I hope they do is they work with third world countries and cities to help them uh, do better. Uh, I'm interested in seeing them work with uh, developing countries like Africa and, and other places like that. And so every year we're getting together now as a board and beginning to give it more and more direction as time goes on. Uh, we have a, a number of uh, programs, different kinds of uh, uh, conferences. One of the more famous ones is every year in January we host a conference in Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, you're all welcome and invited to participate. Uh, but uh, we also have one in New York City in June, and that's where we, uh, we acknowledge the, uh, the top city of the year. Um, we're, um, we're located in New York City and we welcome each and every one of you to be a part of this. You can do that through your uh, city government, but um, this is your institute, this is your uh, organization, you're part of it as every citizen of this community. So I thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, and uh, this is maybe now town good, uh, time to introduce myself. My name is Wayne Olaf, and uh, I'm employed by City of Tallinn as a director of ICT. But now I am serving Mr. Young as a moderator. <laughs> but uh, anyway, good, uh, uh, quite uh, quite interesting, I think, uh, for me also, because uh, despite what uh, I have been several times in New York City get, and we have had uh, several discussion on these topics and any time uh, I have discovered something new. But anyway, got questions from audience. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for a very nice presentation. But uh, if I look at uh, the geography of the winners, for example, OK, they, they just Europe. The northern part is, is quite well represented. Finland, Sweden, UK, Ireland, even some big countries like Germany, France, but we can find in, even Greece. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Tallinn is several times uh, as a prize winner, seven times or? No, it's just a fifth. Fifth, oh, okay. Uh, uh, and, okay, we are very close to the Scandinavia, but still Tallinn is the only country from the Central Eastern Europe. Why? Okay, uh, well, uh, I'll give you uh, one reason. Um, the way this has been structured is uh, we don't just award a city. Uh, a city has to want to have it. Uh, cities that, buildings, who want to have recognition for being a smart building or um, a green building, uh, they don't just get it this way. You know, you have to want it and you have to apply. And so what we do is we say if you are really interested in this, uh, if we just give you an award, what's the point? You have to work for it. You have to work hard. In fact, these cities work all year long to get this. It's not an easy thing to get. 
uh, the first thing they do is they look at the application form. It's over 30 pages sometimes. And they answer these questions, and not one person can answer all the questions. Sometimes it forces people to pull together, and uh, you create a, a unit, uh, a committee. And people afterwards say, you know what? We're so pleased we did it because this is the first time we've ever brought all this information together for the first time. It's like an audit. Economic developers in various cities use this information to help sell their city. Uh, but they didn't have that information before. Another reason is uh, in some of these places, they're just not smart. Uh, they haven't got the facilities. They haven't invested. Uh, you know, uh, there are lots of places that you might point to, like in Australia. Um, some of those cities along the coast, they're fine. But other places, they just don't have the services. My son... Uh, lived up here in a place called Harvey Bay, north of Brisbane by Fraser Island. Um, and I was there for six weeks and I, it was driving me mad. I couldn't use the internet. It was so slow. It was related to the telephone. Um, there are many places um, that just don't get it yet. You know, uh, I've been working very hard in China in South America, in Africa, Australia, those are my areas that I focus on. Uh, we have uh, lots of people who respond in North America, but you can still tell lots of places don't have it. Uh, we know that lots more can happen in Europe, um, but it's a matter of those cities wanting it. And so I spend a lot of time, as do my colleagues, promoting the fact that if you want to be recognized as an intelligent community, you have to go through a long process. And I think it's worthwhile from a, from a promotional point of view and, and a city development point of view. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. Uh, by the way, got the, this question partly was addressed to me again. And I can say that uh, that's what Tallinn, that's for a few times. Uh, and today, got when we had a discussion uh, with uh, city mayor again, I also said that uh, this is like a benchmarking. We, uh, this is like a competition. Uh, when you are participating in uh, world games on ours or uh, uh, a competition here against sport competition uh, in Estonia, because you are able to win. You are thinking so, again. And we are trying also, again. And uh, this is not only Tallinn as a city organization. We are talking about the uh, city as a community. City as a community, it includes all uh, non-profit organizations, uh, uh, local uh, authorities, state authorities, and uh, also all institutions related to education, like uh, universities and etc. Last time uh, when a colleague of uh, John was here, got, we visited the Tallinn Technical University and had the same, same story. Got. We had to be good, somewhere good, measured, good, if we would like to see and compare us, we have ours good, we have to do something. Yeah? Other questions? Any comments? Yeah? Thank you for a good uh, lecture. I want to ask uh, who funds this uh, institution and who is uh, in, uh, interested in this technology investment in global perspective? Yeah. So sometimes, uh, sometimes if you really believe in something, uh, you have to put some resources to it. Uh, so uh, there are three of us who spend a lot of my, our own money out of our own back pocket to get it started. Uh, and we, uh, uh, but we also had help. Uh, we were all three involved with uh, the World Trade Centers and with a group called the World Teleport Association. Teleports are the facilities that link the satellites and the ground stations. Um, and we were all involved in boards uh, that believed in this, so they helped to fund some pieces of it. Uh, but over the years, uh, the three co-founders had to put a lot of our own resources, and we still put a lot of our time and energy into it. Nobody pays us. Uh, we do have a, uh, an office in New York. Uh, we have 10 staff, and they have to be paid. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, this is more of a passion for some of us than it is a business. Uh, it, and it's called a social enterprise. 
And remember, there was a slide there that said, it's very confusing today. Uh, how do you actually make money out of a social enterprise? Uh, but again, uh, it sometimes takes uh, more than the profit motive to, uh, to make these things work. Um, who gets involved? Uh, city governments, uh, CIOs, uh, economic developers, urban planners, but uh, also organizations, uh, groups like Garage 48 and uh, uh, Enterprise Estonia and you know groups like that would and should uh, get involved in these sorts of things. The universities uh, should and could get involved. Uh, the, this, uh, this college should be involved on a regular basis. Why? Because it's good for talent creation, a talent attraction, but also talent retention. Uh, you all have a, 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 a responsibility for, for that in one form or another. Uh, it's good for your city and, and for, your, uh, for your children at the end of the day uh, because what we're trying to create here is a better community, a uh, better place for you to live, uh, but also when you have children, a uh, better place for them to make a decision to stay. Uh, so those are the, those are the reasons. Uh, and uh, are there funding opportunities for others to participate? Yes, um, we had a conversation at uh, Garage 48 yesterday about the fact that you, know, you, you saw a number of companies uh, in, in the smart city part, the Cisco's, the Siemens, the IBM's, all of those vendors have an interest in smart cities, intelligent communities, because these are the cities that they're all looking to for new ideas. You know, some of these companies, I deal with them all over the world. The Tata's, the Tech Mahindra's in India, the, the Wipro's and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Huawei's in China. Uh, they're no different than the Western companies. They're all big. Some of them have 300,000 employees. They're, they're not uh, agile. They're not inventive. They have to feed all these administrators and everything else uh, in their organizations. Why is it important to them to be involved? Because they're looking for the next app. They're looking for the next big uh, thing that's going to make them lots of money. And they're not going to find it within their own companies because they don't spend the research that they used to. They can't. So what they're doing is they're looking at the Garage 48s. They're looking for you know, others like that who have the ideas, who are, have the passion, who are going to bump into each other. Peanut butter and chocolate all of a sudden makes a completely different concept, a different product. And uh, that's what they're looking for. And so they're looking to cities like this where there's passion, where there's interest, where there's the opportunity. And that's what we're interested in, is to make sure that cities like this, regions like this, communities like this exist and we're out there promoting it and encouraging cities to be part of it. Thank you, John. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Ulozin and I asked three questions. I hope I can remember them all. So yes. At first, I understand that you have been in Tallinn not the first time, but many times. And uh, when I listen somebody to talk about, uh, I always wait uh, that as a selectioner keep his own ideal of this thing. Uh, if you can give ideal for world, or maybe for Tallinn, if you can give your ideal view, what will be Tallinn the uh, uh, smartest city in the world at all? Uh, and uh, and uh, if you answer these questions, that I think it's, it's very good. Okay, so maybe uh, if I can interpret that. Yes. Uh, what, what you're asking me is, <clears throat> what's my idea about I my idea or my Im observation, yes. my impression, okay, of talent as a smart city and intelligent community? But you can uh, do more. What, what can you do more? Yes. Okay. We've had a conversation around that. So, uh, Tallinn is a global leader in uh, having the technology and being a, um, an early adopter. Uh, you have recognized that technology is, 
is there, available to be used, and you've used it. Uh, you're not afraid to try something. Uh, you're not afraid to, you know, like in the, the, the poster that uh, Garage 48 has, you say, screw it, let's do it. Uh, and in fact, you do. That's my impression of the community. Uh, some other people would say, no, we're much more conservative, and, and so there are debates around that. But I think that Tallinn always as a community has been using technology well before many other cities that I see around the world. Uh, the parking app, the, the way you work with your students, uh, and, and you know, you're using mobile applications more than I see in other places. Uh, the, uh, uh, the smart card and, and your identity cards and your new bus cards with an RFID tag. I don't see that in many other places. So Tallinn is a great example of advanced uh, methodologies and technologies that, um, uh, that you do. But I think that you're, you're, you're not taking advantage of the fact that uh, you have this great uh, system. I heard today for the first time, I didn't know, that you have free mobility. Who does that? Not very many places provide free mobility. Everything is about a profit motive in the United States. Uh, in other places, they can't afford to do that, but somehow you're doing it. It's very innovative. Again, you're an early adopter about these ideas. But who knows about it? I didn't hear about it uh, in January. Your, your biggest problem is, is you're not telling others. You think it's, you know, everybody else is doing it. No, they're not. What you're doing is unique and special. You need to tell the world. Problem is, it costs money to do that. Problem is, if you don't do that, others will eventually figure it out. They'll do it, but they'll tell the world. You know, uh, Ford was not the first person to invent a car. Uh, what he did was he figured out how to make it on a process and how to sell it. He marketed it. Bell was not the first person to invent the telephone. But he figured out how to deal with the patent and then market it and sell it. Tallinn is the first to do certain things. But if you're not going to go out and market it and tell the world about it, you're not going to get the investment to come here. You're not going to keep the, st the students and the talent because maybe they don't even know. You need to tell yourselves and the world how great you are. I think that's your biggest problem. Thank you. Uh, I guess time is running out, Ken. So it's time to finalize, Ken. And uh, John, thank you from my side. The rector uh, would like to say a couple of words. Ken, maybe. No, well, I just uh, uh, want to uh, oh. give some tips from oh. the college. And thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was very, very nice. Thank you very much. Did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody.